I walked away from that thinking about how can I, as a leader, be the best possible servant for my teams? And as I approach my writing, I know that I am, in essence, a servant to my readers. And Mm. what they're looking for, they're looking for powerful, inspiring characters. And they want to understand what the transformational things are in those characters' adventures. You are now listening to the Highlight Real Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, certified self-leadership trainer and author of the best-selling book, Stay the Course, Dom Brightman. And you're going to be getting some goodies today from the guest that's up next. And today on the High Live Real Builder for Authors, known as GMP, the great, glorious, and glamorous, we got one heck of a superstar off the for you today, baby. Because side to side, peanut butter to jelly, gold and silver, well, today it feels like palladium, because my goodness, it's, it's usually me doing the stalking and the homework, but today's guest actually did homework on the host, which is a rarity. So he's already got five stars, and we haven't even really had the conversation yet that's been talked about with y'all so my goodness let's go into this superstar of the human today because this wonderful human right here grew up in the great state of michigan the mighty michigan and after he began writing fiction in high school and after a long career in the corporate world he took up the craft full-time in the year where the millennium became legal 2018 he writes detective fiction for both adults and kids from his home on the atlantic ocean and the magical city of Jacksonville, Florida. So let's give it up for the T.S. himself, a.k.a. the good shepherd of the fiction world, Terry Shepard. <laughs> that is the best introduction I've ever had, Dom. And I got to tell you, as I was doing my homework, I am certain that we are brothers from another mother because <laughs> your version of the seven habits of elite People and sustainable success are the same things that I credit for whatever good fortune I've had in my life. So it is an honor to be with you. Woohoo! Yes, indeed. The art is mutual, baby. It's like an honor sandwich. It's like we're a bun, and this podcast is the meat in the middle. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But my goodness, the creative edge is real. The creative edge is real. Because my goodness, like, dude, like, my man's a fellow podcast host, award-winning author. I'm like, dude. And, like, most of your books, my goodness, like, they're in dual languages, both English and Spanish. Like, most folks are lucky if they get their book out there. And if it stays on Amazon and if it sells a copy or two, like, they even rare occasion where they actually put it in Spanish, too. So, my goodness, man, congratulations. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Well, you got to speak to the audience, right? You know who they are. There's an old uh, saying that I believe in, and that is that you don't have to throw the party. You just have to show up at the party and add value. So that's what I wanted to do is find out where that party was and make sure that I was in evidence. Man, oh, man. Yes, indeed. I'm telling you, he has the best party hat ever right now because he found the half of the party, baby. I'm telling you, chasing Vega, baby chasing vega but hey as we, you know with all introductions you know they're not allowed to be 50 states long so mind filling in any cavities i may have missed about you my man terry oh you 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 read it just exactly the way that mickey wrote it at the creative edge and i couldn't ask for anything better it's it's an honor to be with you <laughs> oh man Woohoo! well that's good that's good it feels good not to miss any cavities yeah definitely <laughs> I think that's the first time in any interview that I've ever had a dental analogy used. (laughs) I guess for the rest of the conversation, we'll be making sure that we're flossing and uh, gargling and doing all that good stuff. (laughs) Well, hey, I guess as an analogy, I mean, I guess editors will be the flossers for the books, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, they they really are. You know, it's it's, some... Really, what we are as authors is we're just kind of the front people for the amazing team that's behind us. And and 
for me, it all began with purpose. Life for me is about defining and chasing purpose. It's going to sound familiar to you because I know, Dom, that you live this. We're put on this earth to figure out what we're supposed to do. And I believe that I was put on this earth to inspire people to think beyond their self-imposed limitations. So what I did when I decided to write fiction was I populated Chasing Vega with this huge diverse cast, Latinas, LGBTQ, African-Americans, a guy on the autism spectrum, all in heroic roles. And the goal was to inspire readers who live in those bodies to believe that they could be those heroes too. And that that is how Chasing Vega came to be. And um, it's the thing that inspires me to get up every day and keep writing. Oh yeah, yes indeed. And it's great that you did that too, because that's really what was missing a lot and with a lot of books until I guess in recent years when folks started to realize, okay, we have the stereotypical, I don't know, random hero of a certain type. And it's like, you know what? Let's go to the wonderful LGBT world and pick out some for them. You know, they're they're getting more marketing and publicity out there. They want more representation. Well, let's give them representation. Like, hey, black folks, like, hey, we've we've been beaten for years, still getting beaten. It's like, hey, let's give them some representation too. And just going to the folks that really need to be highlighted in a way, especially in the world of fiction, because it's like, hey, it's it's a big world out there, and we can make it bigger in the written world. You know, that, that is so true. And the only way that we really can learn is to walk. We can't walk exactly in one another's shoes, but we can walk together and beside each other. And part of the research that was so important for me in Chasing Vega was getting to understand the nuances of these cultures. And in the case of folks on the spectrum, what's really going on inside their heads. I mean, the most glorious thing that I discovered was that behind you know, the, the translation challenges that some of those folks have socially are huge hearts and super sharp brains. And I get the most mail on Chasing Vega about Joey Price, my medical examiner who is on the spectrum and who is truly the smartest guy in the room. He just sits there quietly waiting for everybody to lose their temper. And when they <laughs> shut up, he answers the question and figures it out. And that's what I love because that's what really these people are. To sit with my uh, friend, Tracy Reese, who is the real-life Latina cop on whom uh, Jessica Ramirez is based, and hear about her 25 years of challenges as one of the first minority women in law enforcement in her department and how she had to overcome all these things that kept on happening till the day she retired. It not only broke my heart, but it talked about something that you talk about in your amazing Stay the Course book, and that's resilience, right? That is the absolute key. And whatever you do, whether you're an author like I am or the corporate world, a podcast host, you're going to have those days where you feel it's been two steps forward and five steps back. <laughs> and, and that's when resilience separates the winners from the also-rans. I mean, that's really the only thing. If you think about everybody that you know that you've interviewed, a common thread, and I heard this in the shows that I listened to, is at some point in time, they were challenged. They had their encounter with post-traumatic stress. They had to deal with a life trauma. And what happened at that moment was the thing that transformed them into the elite performers and to rise from whatever those ashes are and fly like a phoenix. Um, so that's one of the things that's that's key to the plots in my books is that, you know, one of my friends says what you do with your protagonists is you run them up a tree and then you, when they're stuck up there and can't get down, you start throwing hand grenades at them. <laughs> well, I love doing that because it's fascinating to watch how they learn, how they're resilient, how they overcome, and how they prevail. And that's a lesson for life, my friend, because you and I have to deal with that every day in whatever walk of life we chosen to a bar and stories about people who are resilient and uh, are able to learn from their challenges and prevail. I think you can't ever write enough of them. Uh, heck yeah, I could definitely say that again. One of the things that I find that is fascinating to me about this whole motivational space is that when I was out on the road doing motivational speeches, my speeches were essentially the same. I talked about a lot of the stuff that you talk about. I have my thing was the seven things we don't teach you in school, seven secrets mm. of success. 
and they're very, very similar. It's, it's so great to be to be reading Stay the Course because I was just hearing all of those things. We become what we think about. We become who we hang with. Take care of your body. You get to keep it longer. Those kind of things are fundamental truths. But the fascinating thing to me is that when you wrap them around, you know, you say them a little bit differently every time. And I always picked a different theme every year. So the last one, I, when I finally got off the road, my last year was striving and thriving in challenging times. And I basically said the same stuff under that title. And at the end, I bet you this happens to you when you talk at the end, people come up and they say, my gosh, you just opened up a vista of wisdom to me. And I'm saying, I've been reading this stuff since I was a junior high kid. And I thought everybody knew that you become what you think about. I mean, that's like 101. But you know what, Dom? It's cardio. That's what mm. it is. We got to keep doing that cardiovascular stuff, not just for our body so we get to keep it longer, but also for our mind and our spirit. And, you know, that's the key for me. For me, selling books is really secondary. If I can convince one young woman of color to become a cop and maybe help transform law enforcement, then I've succeeded. I've totally succeeded. And that's why I do it. If I can convince one kid on the autism spectrum that he can become a medical examiner, that's success for me. And that is why I do what I do. And that's the thing that fires me up to get up every morning and look at that blank page and try and find something interesting for Jessica Ramirez to do. <laughs> oh man. Well, that's definitely solid gold flow right there, my man. And it's great that you're doing that. It's great that really just, really just the circle of life, just really the same things you said in a different way to try to reach different people of a different generation. And with, I guess with this fiction work, it's really just transferring over. So from all of your time in the corporate space, what do you think has been, heck, well, yeah, you're special. What do you think are the three major things that have helped you become a better writer and author as a result of your time in corporate? One of the biggest things that influenced my leadership was a friend of mine, a friend of my dad's actually, who was a multi, ran a multinational company, sent me the, uh, the book, um, The Servant Leader Book the story of the servant leader. And um, it was written by this guy who was a Bell Labs dude who was allowed to research stuff. And he tried to figure out what it was that was the ultimate secret of success. And he came across this story that maybe you've heard about a group of guys who wanted to go and try and find this brilliant um, guru that was in the midst of deepest, darkest Africa. So they put together this big old caravan of people and they hired box carriers when they got there and they headed off trying to find this wise man. And along the way, they discovered that one of the guys that was carrying boxes for them seemed to have this peaceful centering influence. And when they would run into trouble, he always seemed to know the right questions to ask. And kept peace when people were arguing because these three guys were, you know, all very successful. They were all high ego people and they all thought they knew what was right. Well, one night this guy disappeared. He was gone. And of course the whole expedition fell into disarray. They broke up, went home, except one night, one guy, one of the three guys decided he was going to continue the quest. And along the way he suffered. He had lots of challenges because he was going through many cultures, many cities, and learned what it was like to be poor and homeless and learned what it was like to have to work very hard for very little remuneration so that he could keep things going. And as you might guess, he did come across that amazing tribe where this guru lived. And as he was ushered in to meet the guy, of course, it was the box carrier. It was <laughs> the servant, right? The servant as leader. So I walked away from that thinking about how can I, as a leader, be the best possible servant for my teams? And as I approach my writing, I know that I am, in essence, a servant to my readers. And mm. what they're looking for, they're looking for powerful, inspiring characters. And they want to understand what the transformational things are in those characters' adventures. And... That's the way it is with anything. I remember when I read Bob Iger's book, The Ride of a Lifetime, you know, somebody asked him, why did you buy Lucasfilm? Why did you buy Marvel? He said, I didn't buy it for the movies. 
I bought it for the characters. And if you think about how Marvel's working right now with the multiverse, they killed off Iron Man and people didn't like that, so they rearranged time and space to make it possible for that. I, you know, I, I think that's, that's terrific. And you can't go to a Disney park without seeing those characters for sale in every possible iteration everywhere. So as I think about Jessica, what I hope to do with her, what my long-term goal for her is, is for her to go beyond the written page. She's available now in English and in Spanish. She's available in audiobook. I'm talking with somebody about doing a graphic novel because some of my friends say, man, we need more Latina superheroes and she needs to be in a graphic novel. I would love to be able to sell her to Netflix. Heck, I'd give her to Netflix just so she could be out there influencing people in a very positive way. And that's, that's the long-term goal, to figure out how people can aspire to be like her, to have the values that I've imbued in her of resilience, of you know, having a rock-solid moral compass, and the struggles that come when you are that way and you run into people that don't have that. Those are things that we experience, Dom, in real life every single day. And I think we're inspired when we read books like Stay the Course to want to be better. And if I can write fiction that inspires somebody to want to be better than they are today, that's a victory. Ooh, there we go. My goodness, like that's probably the best thing ever. Like he's like, man, forget the three answers. I've got this one major diamond to give you. <laughs> I take my servant leadership mindset into my words. <laughs> that's, that's it. I mean, that's the secret. I mean, all of those things, everything rolls off of that. We're here to figure out our purpose and then connect a passion to that purpose. And purpose follows passion. And there's another magical thing that people forget about because in our world of marketing, we're always watching TV and the commercials are telling us what we need to buy so we'll be better. And the reality is that money follows passion and purpose. So if you can forget, even, to, even if you're worried about where the rent's coming from next month, if you can forget about the money and focus on passion and our, am I achieving steps toward my purpose every day, then the money follows. It's, it's a magical, magical thing. In the corporate world, the only time I ever really knew what I was earning was when I was negotiating my deal. My wife paid all the bills, and so she knew where the money was. So, I, you know, I never worried about it after that. All I worried about was how can I create an atmosphere where people will want to join me on my quest, and my quest is to make life better for the people that I serve. Um, and that's whether you're a writer, whatever, whatever it is you do, that is the secret. And many of us go through life never really contemplating that. You know, that's what I, this is why I, what I admire about you. I mean, you're, you are obviously here to inspire all kinds of people to think about things like this, to think about the skill sets that they need. What are the, you know, the, the magical things that they, the habits they have to develop to be able to be successful in pursuing a passionate purpose. I think, the world doesn't have enough doms. We need more of you in this world to be able to inspire people who look like you, who've grown up like you, to reach beyond you. There's nothing that I like better than to see somebody who has either read my book or has worked on my team surpass me and go off and do amazing things, things that I might have only dreamed about. That's the highlight of life. So when I get... Um, you know, one of the things that, that I kind of stumbled into was I stumbled into this, uh, this mystery bug project where my granddaughter, who has Down syndrome, was asking me, she said, I'm afraid of COVID. What can I do to protect myself? So what did I do? I wrote a picture book for her, and I used Dr. Seuss poetry to teach masking, hand washing, social distancing, and, and how vaccines work. And that was something that I never thought would happen, but it was aligned with my purpose. I didn't realize it, but the minute she said, this is what I need, I knew that I had to write that book. And right now, I mean, that book is taken off. I do zero marketing on it, but I see it everywhere. I get so much mail about, about it. The way that I, I had it illustrated, my son-in-law, who was a re re reformed lawyer, <laughs> did the illustration. She's a dynamic graphic artist. And I said, it's very important that we make everybody that stars in this thing look like the people that's going to be reading it. So it has a hugely diverse cast. All the people that are doing the cool stuff, the doctors and everything, are people of color. 
And I just, I'm just thrilled by that because what I see, you know, I, I'll walk around and I'll go into a third grade class and I'll see this young third grader who doesn't look like me, but is going to surpass me memorizing. You know, when we were kids, we memorized that, that kind of poetry. We can all think about Sam I am and I do not like green eggs and ham. And, you know, it started on a Monday. She heard Hudson sneeze. <laughs> My granddaughter still only speaks in one or two word sentences because that's part of the developmental challenges for someone with Down syndrome. But she knows that book by heart. And the moment when I first presented it to her and that she opened it up to the hand washing portion, we'd practice that together. And when she saw the picture, she started moving her hands in the hand washing thing. And I was a mess, Dom. I was like all over the floor in tears. My wife had to scoop me up because I was a puddle. But those are the moments that we live for, my friend. Those moments when we see the magic happening before us, when we witness it. And they're few and far between, but we got to make memories of them because on the bad days, that's where we draw our resilience from, from those things that we, maybe they haven't happened yet for your for whoever's listening to this, this podcast right now, but they will if you do the things that you're supposed to do. If you follow Dom's seven habits of elite performance, if you think about why you're here very carefully and very thoughtfully and pursue a passionate purpose, good things happen, man. It's cause and effect. The oldest law in the universe, and it always works. And oh man, and not just from nine to five either. Like I've been, I was joking with folks early in the backlog of this catalog, like summer 2021, these episodes are going to be hotter than fish grease. And I think this is one of those episodes that's definitely <laughs> hotter than fish grease right now. I'm telling you, Thank you. My man is dropping fire, baby. <laughs> Right. <laughs> ah, well, you know, the, 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 uh, one of the books that, I, that helped me a lot as a leader and also I think about often is the book Never Eat Alone. It's written by this guy, Keith Ferrazzi, and he's the new, the new age kind of um, Dale Carnegie. And he talks about how important, it's, this is what you talk about, about um, you know, your advancement angels and your networking and stuff like that. He talks about trying to figure out who the people are that can help you get to where you go. Because as you say in your number 13 in your famous quotes is one of my favorites from Althea Gibson, no matter what accomplishments you make, somebody helped you. You have to figure out who those people are, but you begin by trying to add value to their lives. And when I started writing, that's exactly what I did. I picked my four dream authors, the people I wanted to grow up to be, and I wrote them each a fan letter. And I said, look, I'm not asking for a mentorship. I'm not asking for any favors, but I'm going to be 65 and I'm starting to become an author. What's one thing you'd recommend for somebody like me who wants to get into this writing game? And to a person, they came back and they said, we'll do more than that. Send us a chapter. James Patterson sent me an outline to one of his books. He says, I'm an outliner. Here's an outline to one of my books. Um, Dan Brown said, sign up for my master class. I'm doing a master class. I'd love to get your feedback on what you think about what, what I'm trying to teach. So I had these people that were in my corner and it all, you know, I've never forgotten that. Every time I run into them or see them anywhere, it's not just a selfie. I'm posting about them. I'm trying to help sell their books, you know, on my social media contacts. And the thing that I realized is that that's universal. So I have as much love for the person who's in the midst of publishing their very first book as I do for somebody like James or Megan Abbott. Well, gosh, Megan Abbott just blows my mind. She's such an incredible writer. Um, Tori Eldridge, Kate Anslinger. Oh, gosh, there's so many of them that I've met and I know that are just brilliant, brilliant writers. And, and I love to pass their stuff on um, because through gratitude, giving without the expectation of receiving is when the true return on investment comes. If you can do that, if you can have the faith to give of yourself without expecting something back, that's when Farazi says the magic happens. And I think we all think about that. There are moments in our lives where we've done that, you know. And sometimes it can be something just as simple as, I love going through the drive-thru. My wife says, I, she, I'm still at the store today, so you, you get a treat. You get to go to Burger King for lunch. I love that because she knows what I do. Is I, you know, I always find something nice to compliment the people who work there about. And... um. You know, in those jobs, all they get is angry people. So when somebody comes up and, and 
recognizes this amazing necklace that they're wearing or compliments them on their smile or their kindness. That kind of thing lasts a long time. They take it home with them. They may even tell somebody about it. But what I hope they'll do is I hope they'll model the same behavior. So where my stories are concerned, even, even my bad people, the, the antagonists, they're doing the wrong things for the right reasons. I mean, Vega, what she does is she kills bad guys who got away. She dispatches her own vigilante justice by throwing them into the Grand Canyon, into the Colorado River. And she has darker designs that she's working on that need to be stopped. But what Jessica discovers, ultimately discovers, when she and Vega meet in single combat in the middle of the night in the raging Colorado is that, you know, neutralizing an enemy who's hurt you does not end the suffering. The suffering ends when you decide you want to start working on healing from within. And that was her greatest learning from the story. I'm, you know, I'm giving away a spoiler, but hopefully people are going to want to read the tale to figure out how she got, how she came to that conclusion. But that's, that's her challenge. She's always felt that she's never lived up to her father's expectations. And, um, you know, when he loses his own life as a result of her involvement as a cop, she feels like she let him down. And the one thing she promised him she would always do is protect him. You know, she couldn't do it. So how do you come back from that? I mean, that is the fascinating part of the story is her voyage of self-discovery to learn, you know, what we all learn. And I, I got a great friend who's a grief counselor in South Central LA, and she talks to kids whose moms and dads have died of drug overdoses or have been killed in gang, you know, drive-by shootings. And they say, how can you expect me to go back to the way things were? And what she says is you can never go back to the way things were. You can only take what you've got and build with that. And the reality is that no matter where we are in life, we've got a lot of stuff we could build with. It's just a question of slowing down, taking a look at it, seeing how it aligns with what you were put here to do, and start putting those Legos together. <laughs> you can build some amazing stuff with those darn things. It's great. <laughs> yes, indeed. Definitely great indeed. My goodness, like if y'all haven't head over to TerraShepherd.com while this is going on, y'all definitely to head over after listening to this episode. Indeed, buy all of his wonderful books and be on the lookout for that graphic novel edition as well because it's going to happen. Heck, Nick Flex is going to be one to pick it up. They're giving out checks, so hey, might as well, especially for something like this that is definitely timely. So my goodness, like with those powerful stories of really, and I guess really just that creativity too of basically you reaching out to your dream authors, getting advice from also creating a picture book for your grandkid on, about the whole COVID thing, about how to protect yourself. And heck, even the story of when you put that in a wonderful book about really what a lot of kids deal with is like, how do I live up to the expectations of my parents? Like, my goodness, with all of that. So with in addition to your morning walks, is there anything else that you think may contribute to your creativity as a writer? Habit, right? I mean, you think about um, chapter seven in your book, Consistency, right? I have a routine that I follow every day. I, my alarm rings at 545. By six, I'm out walking. I'm getting my, my daily walk in. And that's where my creative mind, my subconscious just starts to do all kinds of stuff. My characters talk with me. They argue. They throw me suggestions. They tell me things they like and they don't like. And I'm back, you know, I'm back here. I, I, I have breakfast and I'm showered and I am doing my first assignment of the day, which is a thousand good words. I got to write a thousand good words a day. So I do that first. And when I've done that, then I move. I'm also, I'm also a narrator. So I get my narration goals done for the day. And that is either two chapters completed or uh, an hour and a half of narration, whichever comes last right? So I got to, I got to make sure that I hit one or the other. If it takes more than an hour and a half to do two chapters, that's what I do. And once I've gotten those two things done, what I've, what I've discovered is that that's what moves projects forward. You right. And even, you know, my friend Doug Lyle, DP Lyle says, you know, if you get stuck, if you get writer's block, or if you can't find a way to move forward, just start writing, just start writing, go backwards, go sideways, fill in some blanks to start writing because your subconscious mind's going to throw out the answer eventually. And you just wait for the muse to sing. I wish I could turn the muse on. You know, it would be nice if you could throw a switch. But she sings when she wants to sing, not necessarily when you need her to sing. And 
to get that thousand words done, she knows that she's supposed to be up with me and about 8.15, she's supposed to start singing, but she doesn't always do that. Sometimes she'll sing at two in the morning. And that's the other thing is to be flexible and, and think about where the opportunities are in your, in your peripheral vision. So I start out with that framework, Dom. I'm, I try and make sure that I have these daily objectives, minimum objectives that I need to get done no matter what, because I am a craftsman. And if the music is singing, I still have to deliver the product. So I got to figure out how. And I have clients who need to get their audio books published. So it doesn't matter <laughs> if I'm having trouble reading or seeing or, you know, have a stuffy nose or something. I have to make sure that I perform that day in a way that's going to work for them. And knowing that that's a requirement, you fall into those habits and things get done. And then you try and wrap everything else around it. You know, the, the business aspects, the promotional aspects, you fill in the blanks with that stuff. That's why you and I are talking at 9.45 Eastern time <laughs> on a Thursday night. It's because that's what it worked for both of us, right? So <laughs> that, those are my habits. It's a long answer to a very short question that you gave me. I apologize for that. <laughs> Don't worry. Long is usually strong here for the most part. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. I think most people have already tuned out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But don't worry. Those are the folks who don't matter at the moment. They may come back later because my man is tuned into his gifts. My goodness, tuned in, baby. I'm telling you. My goodness. So you got this wonderful podcast, too. So what led to the wonderful podcast? Was it this awesome voice that you have? Or was it just you wanting to serve once again? Like, what, what led to that, man? You know, I, I was thinking about how can I meet as many amazing authors as I possibly can? And I thought about the thing we all need in common. When you need it, I need it. And that's promotion of our stuff. So when my partner, friend, now partner, and authors on the air, Pam Stack, had to step away from the show for a little while for cataract surgery. I subbed for her once, twice, three times. And then she said, okay, I'm not coming back to that one. <laughs> I'll do them when I want. This is now your show. So I was able to go to anybody I wanted to and invite them to join me and to talk about their process, how, you know, how they write, how do they promote their books what are the biggest challenges? What are the habits that they have? I asked this, you know, some common questions. And it's fascinating. I mean, the whole narrator gig happened because I always open my podcast. After I've introduced some, somebody, I read the first stanza from their latest book. I read it so that the listeners can hear what they're buying. And I had one person stop me after that. She says, put some pause on that record button. What's your rate? <laughs> Would you read, that, read my book for me? <laughs> And I hadn't even thought about it, Dom. I mean, this is how these things happen, right? When you create the, the environment and are open to the universe, these things happen. And I'm now, I'm just finishing up my fourth one. I've got two more in the hopper. I just signed a deal tonight to read four more. So my, my goal was to have 10 books done in 2021. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit that number or lose my voice trying. <laughs> <laughs> No, you ain't gonna lose your voice. I ain't gonna let you say that. Nah, <laughs> that, that ain't happening. Definitely is not happening. My goodness. So, any advice for the aspiring podcaster? Since everybody and their mom literally is on their way to starting a podcast of their own. <laughs> a couple of things that I recommend. One is that you know make it about the guest. I mean, for some people they tune in if you think about guys like Dax Shepard and there's, there's others that are like him that that he's part of the draw so you want you you listen to him to be entertained but I think for a lot of folks the reason that they do come to a podcast is they see who the guest is and they want to hear that person speak so you know when you add the great questions that you ask to try and bring out the stuff for them that makes it listenable and then really understanding the why why are you doing it you know are you are you doing it I mean the, the selfish motive for me was to meet as many authors as possible. But the way it connected to purpose and the thing that made it work was that part of my purpose is to help others. And I, by, you know, I've, I've sold a lot of books for people with authors on the air and very happily. I, nothing makes me happier than to have somebody write me afterwards and saying, hey, after this thing ran, I sold 50 books. You know, that just makes me feel like I'm on cloud nine. Um, so, so understand why you're getting into it and then make sure you do it right. 
invest in a decent microphone and invest in, I use the Rode uh, podcast, um, um, podcaster and, um, it's fantastic. It, it, you know, has, makes me sound good. It records 11 different ways. It's our backup tonight. So if you need some backup tracks, they're all there. So invest in the right gear so that you're providing a quality audio product. A lot of people don't do that. Um, and then, you know, stay the course. Keep going because when you start, you aren't going to have any listeners and it's going to take time to build up that listenership. But the cool thing about podcast is somebody may find you at episode number 90, but they're going to go back to episode number one eventually. So whatever you create, make it good art because somebody's going to find it and somebody's going to fall in love with it. Man, oh man. Went from Tez bracelet skirt before we pressed the record button. After record, we went to freaking... Well, the dancer skirt. Now we got the Taj Mahal, the jewels, baby, from the Good Shepherd of the Fiction World, Terry. That's right. That's what I'm talking about, man. Yes, indeed. My man's been dropping heat, baby. Cause you're so darn right. Like that's that's beautiful art about podcasting. Just create that art out there. Folks discover it and be like, hey, what else this person has? And they'll go back and see if they can find some more gems. So. Stay consistent with what you're doing, indeed. So, my goodness. So, just a couple more questions. I'll let you escape. And this question, <laughs> this has probably been a go-to question for probably 99% of the guests for the past 100 episodes, especially for you. So, is there a question that you wish to be asked more often when you're on the guest side of the game? Wow. You know, that, that really is a good question. <laughs> you know, I kind of learned a long time ago when I was a corporate guy and was was taught about how to interact with the media that you come to these things prepared. You, you, you know, you learn about your host, you listen to their show, you try and understand what's going on in their head, why they're doing what they're doing and try and find a way to lift them up as well. But I come prepared with my message and no matter what questions I get asked, I don't stop talking until my message is done till I've gotten it out. So I, I love it when people ask me questions I'd never been asked before. And I'm still new enough with Mickey and the Creative Edge folks that I'm, I'm still getting some, some questions that I haven't answered before. And those are the fun ones because those are the ones that make you think. They make you think beyond where you are right now. And I love it when I have to do that, when I come across some new notion that I haven't thought of before. So I guess I'm evading answering your question because I because, uh I'm not sure what, what question I wish people would ask me. <laughs> I know what I want to say, you're right? So I, I, I don't stop till I've said it. But that's the goal. That's the secret, right? You got to know what you want to say. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, yes, today, so speaking of stuff that gets you to think a lot deeper, people go... <laughs> And what are two directions with this one? I wonder which direction you're going to go with it. And that is if you're to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but this time in the current year of 2021, with all of your knowledge and experience, what advice would you give to yourself? Feel the fear and do it anyway. That's the biggest thing. We all are afraid of risk. There's a little voice called resistance. Seth Godin calls it resistance. That is always speaking to you and telling you all the reasons you shouldn't try something. We all are born with an unworthiness gene, and we don't think that we deserve happiness. We don't think that we deserve success. And we have a little voice that keeps telling us that all the time. And you just have to tell that guy to go stand in the corner because you're going to do it anyway. So if I was 25, I would you know, be saying, dream those big dreams and reach for the clouds. Go for it. Because what's the old saying? If you try for the stars and you only catch an eagle, you still caught an eagle. That's been my experience. I always go into everything I do assuming that I can learn how to be the best that there is in that game. And even if I'm good and not great, good is often good enough. <laughs> you know. But I never stop trying to be better. I mean, that's the other thing. Don't ever, don't ever stop learning. Keep learning your entire life. And keep growing and keep trying to stretch yourself a little bit because once you stop doing that, that's when you start to die. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Indeed, my goodness, feel the fear and do it anyway. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. I love it. Rock solid advice right there. So darn true. Yes, indeed, true and blue. Let's go with royal blue. It's a bright, cool color. Cool as two cucumbers. Yes, indeed. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're having way too much fun on this show, Don. <laughs> You're having way too much fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude. Yep, it's a, a podcast interview where it's disguised as me practicing my dad jokes on people. Yeah. <laughs> Let me stop. Where can I see you perform your stand-up? When you <laughs> Where are you going to be? <laughs> oh, we'll see. We'll see. I've, I've been getting that more often than ever. I'm like, all right, well, we'll see what happens in the coming years. <laughs> oh, man, but speaking of coming years, um, before we ask where we can find you, this actually popped into my head since it was actually one of my earlier questions that finally came back to me. <laughs> and that is, since you started this writing career in your 60s, any advice for those looking to start the second win career? Oh, yeah. I mean, the the um, the second act, the second half is where all the cool stuff happens, right? In the first half, the best football games are where you're going in the locker room behind and you're hearing that inspiring message from your coach and you're talking to your teammates about what you need to adjust. And I think the reality is that no matter what happens to you, there is always opportunity out there. So whether it's age or whether it's whatever you experience in life, there is stuff that you can do that's exciting and fun and new. And there are new friends to be made. There are new mountains to be climbed. And as long as you're breathing, you know, I intend, if I'm lucky enough to get into heaven, I want to slide into home plate making my last Twitter post with a martini in one hand and my cell phone in the other, and I'm going to drop the microphone and drop the cocktail and say, here I am, where should I go? <laughs> tell me whether it's going to be hot or whether it's going to be really pretty. <laughs> you know, just tell me. <laughs> I don't want to leave anything on the table. I want to I want to keep running until I have absolutely no gas in the tank. How many metaphors is that, Tom? <laughs> but you, I'm not going to stop until, until my very last breath. As long as I can breathe, I want to make a difference. I want to have fun. I want to learn. And uh, I want to generate love. I want to generate understanding. I want um, to alleviate suffering. I mean, that's the, when people really get down to the, to the um, philosophical level with me about what purpose is, we're all here for the same reason. We're put here on this earth to alleviate suffering. And the bad things that are happening to us is because people have forgotten that that's why we're here. If we are alleviating suffering, we are looking for equal opportunity for everybody. We're raising all boats. We're putting fear aside, and we're trying to give everybody a voice. We're trying to give everybody opportunity and everybody the chance to be a star. And where the problem comes is when we forget that that is the fundamental reason human beings were given a brain to be able to think about stuff like this. It's because we have the power, like nobody, no other animal on this earth, to consciously do things to make the world better. And we got to use it. We absolutely have to use it. It's not used enough. but And sometimes I think the biggest challenge that you, you feel as an individual is, you know, what can I as one person do? What podcast host, one author do when the world's problems are so huge? Well, you're not responsible for solving the problems, but you are responsible for contributing to the solution in some way. We all have to do that. And the challenge in life is figuring out how. So that's where, that's what purpose is and Figure out a way to do it with passion, and then you'll get all the money you need, and life will be one crazy adventure. It'll be a roller coaster ride that you'll get off of at the end, and you'll say, Man, I can't believe I rode that thing, but I'm sure glad I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, for those who'll be glad that they'll ride the wonderful roller coaster of all of your magical books and buy a bunch of copies of your magical books, what's the best way for folks to go out, not only buy your books, but keep up with all the stuff that you're doing? Everything starts at terryshepherd.com. That's where all I'm, I'm on all the major platforms. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, I'm at Clubhouse, I'm on Twitter, uh, I write on Medium, all that stuff. It's all out there, but it's all available at terryshepherd.com. And uh, my address, if you want to write me an email and Tell me what a horrible job I did in this program. It's Terry at TerryShepherd.com. Got to make it the brand, right? Like DomBrightman.com. You did that. That's great. So you, <laughs> that's the cool thing about having a cool name like yours is there, the, the address is still available with a .com on the end, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. You should try to snag fiction, Shepard, if you can, if it ain't stolen yet. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping that at some point in time, Terry Shepard will be well enough known that it'll be reflexive for people. And when they hear the name, they'll, they'll associate it with a great 
experience in entertainment and information and enlightenment. And if that happens, even for one person, I mean, I had this miracle thing happen. We were flying back from Detroit last week, and I happened to be sitting behind a woman who was reading one of my books. And wow. I don't sell that many books yet. So wow. for that to happen, you know, you talk about this these sign when the universe is telling you what you should that you're on the right track. When mm -hmm. that happens, you better listen because <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I took a picture of it and I asked her, I said, where did you get that book? And she said, oh, my daughter lives in North Carolina. She really likes this Jessica gal. So she told me to read it. So I'm reading. I said, well, are you enjoying it? She says, yeah. She says, and I said, well, I'm, I'm Terry Shepard. <laughs> and she wow. looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> she thought I was crazy. <laughs> wow. But, you know, that's, uh, that was the moment. And occasionally we get those, and that gives us the strength to carry on when you got to come back and there's a blank screen and you got to come up with your thousand words. Man. <laughs> Man. Hashtag powerful. That's what this episode is. My goodness. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Man. Well, no, nothing much else to say after that. Anything you want to add before we close up shop? <laughs> Dom, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. I mean, I, I listened to a ton of podcasts, and for some reason, you had not crossed my radar until we scheduled this, this interview. And um, uh, I found myself spending an awful lot. You know, I have a lot of podcasts on my podcatcher, but I found myself, I'd finish one, and I'd see the, I'm going to try the next one. And I found myself like 15 hours into this thing, you know, listening on the airplane coming back from D Detroit. And and enjoying every moment uh, the the commonality of success is just all over your podcast and i wish you great success in your life because you're you're clearly your purpose and your passion are aligned and success is inevitable when that happens my friend so thank you thank you for having me on the show you just got done listening to another powerful power packed episode of the going north podcast i hope you really enjoyed what you heard Go check out the guest stuff. It's all in the show notes on the website, dombrighton.com, and also reach out to those that you've just heard as well. And keep going north.